We welcome you this beautiful autumn Sabbath morning from the Tabernacle in Salt Lake City to the fourth general session of the 166th semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We acknowledge the large audience assembled in the Tabernacle, in the overflow gathering in the nearby assembly hall, where Elders Jeffrey R. Holland, Spencer J. Condy, and W. Don Ladd are seated on the stand, and in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, where Elders Gene R. Cook, Alex B. Morrison, Neil L. Anderson, and C. Max Caldwell are in attendance. We extend our greetings to those of you who are participating by radio, television, cable, or satellite transmission. We are grateful to the owners and operators of these various facilities who are broadcasting this conference. We acknowledge the presence this morning of government, education, and civic leaders, those of other faiths who honor us, honor us with their presence, and members of the Church who have assembled to worship together. The Tabernacle Choir, under the direction of Craig Jessup, with Richard Elliott at the organ, opened these services by singing praise to the Lord. The choir will now sing Our Savior's Love, following which Elder Lance B. Wickman of the Seventy will offer the invocation. Our Father, which art in heaven, we are so grateful for this beautiful autumn morning, for the colors and magnificence that remind us of the greatness of thy creations. Our Father, we are grateful for the privilege that is ours of assembling in this great hall and in clusters and congregations of thy saints across the earth. We pray for the day that 
Such freedom may exist in every corner of the world, that thus the gospel may be preached in its fullness. Our Father, we are grateful for thy prophet, our beloved prophet, President Hinckley, and for each of those whom we sustain as an apostle and a prophet. How grateful we are to live in a day when there are apostles and prophets upon the earth, when the priesthood and the gospel are here in its fullness. And Father, we acknowledge with gratitude to live in such a day that was only dreamed of by those of bygone eras. Most of all, Heavenly Father, we are grateful for thy Son, thy beloved Son, our Savior and Redeemer, whose love provides for us the atonement and the resurrection and the path home to thee. We are grateful for his life, his example, and teachings that light that path. Father, we pray that thy blessing may be upon our prophet dear and upon each of these whom we sustain as apostles and prophets. May each have life and health, vigor and strength to shoulder the awesome burdens that he carries. We pray, Father, that thou will bless each of us who serves as an officer or a teacher or is just a member of this church that we may always be found attentive to that garden plot assigned to us. We pray thy blessing to be upon those who will speak or sing in this session of conference. May thy spirit invest their words and the music that they may be carried into our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pray that this hour we will have listening ears and accepting hearts and feet that will run swiftly to obey thy will as it finds expression. We pray especially, Father, for those with drooping shoulders under the burden of illness and sadness and despair, that their burden may be lightened or lifted in this hour, and more importantly, that we who are here and attending may, in our service and ministerings, help to lift such burdens. We thank thee again for the privilege of being here. Humbly and meekly we invoke thy blessing and thy spirit to be upon us and within us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Brother Wickman. We shall now be pleased to listen to President James E. Faust, second counselor in the first presidency. President Faust. My dear brothers and sisters and friends, the responsibility of speaking to you today prompts me to earnestly ask for your faith and prayers. Today I speak to those who have heart-rending challenges. I speak to those who suffer, to those who mourn and have heartaches. I speak to those with physical, mental, or emotional pain. I speak to those born crippled or who have become crippled. I speak to those who are born blind or who can no longer see the sunsets. I speak to those who have never been able or can no longer hear birds sing. I speak to those who have the privileged responsibility of helping others who have mental and physical disabilities. I also speak to those who may be in serious transgression. I take as my text the words of the Savior to the sorrowing Mary Magdalene, who stood without the sepulcher weeping. As she turned around, she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? The Savior was speaking not just to the sorrowing Mary. He was also speaking to us, men, women, and children, and all of mankind ever born or yet to be born. For the tears of sorrow, pain, and remorse are the common lot of mankind. The complexities of this life at times tend to be very dehumanizing and overwhelming. Some have so much while others struggle with so very little. 
It is a joy to meet with the faithful saints of the Church all over the world. Even though some of them have difficulties and challenges and lack material wealth, yet they seem to find much happiness and are able to walk in faith over the rough cobblestones of life. Their deep faith strengthens ours as we meet with them. Many who think that life is unfair do not see things within a larger vision of what the Savior did for us through the Atonement and the Resurrection. Each of us has at times agony, heartbreak, and despair when we must, like Job, reach deep down inside to the bedrock of our own faith. The depth of our belief in the resurrection and the atonement of the Savior will, I believe, determine the measure of courage and purpose with which we meet life's challenges. The first words of the risen Lord to his disciples were, Peace be unto you. He has also promised peace in this world and eternal life in the world to come. The Atonement and the Resurrection have taken place. Our Lord and Savior suffered that appalling agony in Gethsemane. He performed the ultimate sacrifice in dying on the cross and then breaking the bonds of death. All of us benefit from the transcendent blessings of the Atonement and the Resurrection through which the divine healing process can work in our lives. The hurt can be replaced by the joy the Savior promised. To the doubting Thomas, Jesus said, Be not faithless, but believing. Through faith and righteousness, all of the inequities, injuries, and pains of this life can be fully compensated for and made right. Blessings denied in this life will be fully recompensed in the eternities. Through complete repentance of our sins, we can be forgiven and we can enjoy eternal life. Thus, our suffering in this life can be as the refining fire purifying us for a higher purpose. Heartache can be healed, and we can come to know a soul-satisfying joy and happiness beyond our dreams and expectations. The resolution promised by the Atonement and the Resurrection continues in eternity. Physical limitations will be compensated. Alma's words are comforting. The soul shall be restored to the body, and the body to the soul. Yea, every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost but all things shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame. The resolution is brought about by the Savior's intercession. As he said in the great intercessory prayer found in the 17th chapter of John, And this is life eternal, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Then the Savior prayed for his apostles and all of the saints, saying, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are mine. And all mine are thine, and all thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. All of us have made wrong terms along the way. I believe the kind and merciful God whose children we are will judge us as lightly as he can for the wrongs that we have done and give us the maximum blessing for the good that we do. Alma's sublime utterance seems to me an affirmation of this, said Alma. And not many days hence the Son of God shall come in his glory, and his glory shall be the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, equity, and truth, full of patience, mercy, and long-suffering, quick to hear the cries of his people and to answer their prayers. A vital importance in resolving transgression, experience the healing process, 
which comes from repentance. As President Kimball reminds us, the principle of repentance, arising again whenever we fall, brushing ourselves off and setting off again on that upward trail is the basis for our hope. It is through repentance that the Lord Jesus Christ can work his healing miracle, infusing us with strength when we are weak, health when we are sick, hope when we are downhearted, love when we feel empty, and understanding when we search for truth. One of the tender stories of the Book of Mormon takes place when Alma speaks to his son Corianton who has fallen into transgression while on a mission to the Zoramites. As he counsels him to forsake his sin and return again to the Lord, he learns that Coriantin is worried about what will happen to him in the re resurrection. There follows a detailed treatment of the probationary state of this life, of justice versus mercy, and God's plan for our happiness in the hereafter culminating in this verse. And mercy claimeth the penitent, and mercy cometh because of the atonement, and the atonement bringeth to pass the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the dead bringeth back men unto the presence of God, and thus they are restored into his presence to be judged according to their works, according to the law and justice. The Savior gives us a profound key by which we can cope with and even surmount the debilitating forces of the world, said the Savior. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. This grand key then is that, regardless of the saturation of wickedness around us, we must stay free from the evil of the world. The Savior's prayer both commands us to avoid evil and proffers divine help to do so. Through this effort, we become one with our Lord. The prayer of the Savior in Gethsemane was that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one with us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. To remain true and faithful through this mortal veil of tears, we must love God with all our heart, might, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves. We must also stand together as families, as members of wards and branches, stakes, and districts, and as a people. To our neighbors not of our faith, we should be as a good Samaritan who cared for the man who fell among thieves. We must gather strength from each other. We must also succor the weak, lift up the hands that hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. Paul taught well on this subject, said he to the Corinthians, speaking of the body or the Church of Christ, that there should be no schism in that body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And whether one member suffer or all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. In this way, as individuals and as a people, we may be kept from evil. As we go through travail and difficulty, we may feel sorry for ourselves in despair. But with the love of God and the saints unitedly bearing each other's burdens, we can be happy and overcome evil. Some faithful women have been denied that which is at the very center of their souls. In the eternal plan, no blessing will be kept from the faithful. No woman should question how the Savior values womanhood. The grieving Mary Magdalene was the first to visit the sepulcher after the crucifixion. And when she saw that the stone had been rolled away and that the tomb was empty, she ran to tell Peter and John. The two apostles came to see and then went away sorrowing. But Mary stayed. She had stood near the cross. She had been at the burial. And now she stood 
weeping by the empty sepulcher. There she was honored to be the first mortal to see the risen Lord. After he said, Woman, why weepest thou? She was instructed by him, Go to thy, my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. During his mortal ministry, Jesus left Judea to go to Galilee. He arrived at Jacob's well, thirsty and weary from traveling. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jewish convention at the time for bad dealings with Samaritans. Yet Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God which is within thee, Give me to drink that thou wouldst ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Jesus went on to teach her about the living water, springing up unto everlasting life. The Samaritan woman responded, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Then she said unto him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he has come, he will tell us all things. At this point, Jesus revealed his true identity to her. I that speak unto thee am he. The resurrection and the atonement of the Savior can be a constant fortifying influence in our lives, as illustrated by the account of Elizabeth Jackson, pioneer in the Martin Handcart Company. She tells of the death of her husband Aaron on the Wyoming Plains in 1856 in these moving words. About nine o'clock I retired. Bedding had become very scarce, so I did not disrobe. I slept until, as it appeared to me, about midnight. I was extremely cold. The weather was bitter. I listened to hear if my husband breathe. He lay so still. I could not hear him. I became alarmed. I put my hand on his body, when to my horror I discovered that my first fears were confirmed. My husband was dead. I called for help to the other inmates of the tent. They could render me no aid, and there was no alternative but to remain alone by the side of the corpse till morning. Oh, how the dreary hours drew their tedious length along. When daylight came, some of the male part of the company prepared the body for burial, and oh, such a burial and funeral service. They did not remove his clothing. He had but little. They wrapped him in a blanket and placed him in a pile with 13 others who had died, and then covered him up with snow. The ground was frozen so hard that they could not dig a grave. He was left there to sleep in peace until the trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall awake and come forth in the morning of the first resurrection. We shall then again unite our hearts and lives, and eternity will furnish us with life evermore. To the question, Woman, why weepest thou? We turn to the comforting words written by the faithful, to the faithful saints by John in the book of Revelations. These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him by day and night in his temple, and he sitteth on the throne that dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. To the question, woman, why weepest thou? I testify of the great atoning sacrifice and breaking of the bonds of death by the Lord Jesus Christ which shall indeed wipe away our tears. I have a witness of this. It has been given by the Holy Spirit of God. 
I also testify that the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of this church today. We see his omnipotent hand guiding this holy work. I further testify to the prophetic calling and great leadership of President Gordon B. Hinckley as his servant under whose inspired direction we are all privileged to serve. President Monson and our beloved associates are witnesses of this. I pray, as did King Benjamin, that we shall be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in work, good works, that Christ the Lord omnipotent may seal us his, that we may be brought to heaven, that we may have everlasting salvation and eternal life through the wisdom and power and justice and mercy of him who created all things in heaven and in earth, who is God above all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. President James E. Faust, second counselor in the First Presidency, has just spoken to us, and the Tabernacle Choir has sung, Come Ye Children of the Lord. We shall now be pleased to hear from Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. My brothers and sisters, I've chosen to speak about the relationship between our partaking of the sacrament and our enjoying the blessings available from the gift of the Holy Ghost. In modern revelation, the Lord commanded that thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world, thou shalt go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day. As we partake of the sacrament each week, we ponder the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we reaffirm and renew the covenants we made when we were baptized. 
These acts of worship and commitment are described in the revealed prayer the priest offers upon the bread. As stated in that prayer, we partake of the bread in remembrance of the body of our Savior. And by doing so, we witness to God, the Eternal Father, that we are willing to take upon us the name of His Son and always remember Him and keep His commandments which He has given us. After we were baptized, hands were laid upon our heads and we were given the gift of the Holy Ghost. When we consciously and sincerely renew our baptismal covenants as we partake of the sacrament, we renew our qualification for the promise that we may always have His Spirit to be with us. We cannot overstate the importance of that promise. President Wilfred Woodruff called the gift of the Holy Ghost the greatest gift we can receive in mortality. Unfortunately, the great value of that gift and the important conditions for its fulfillment are not well understood. Nephi prophesied that in the last days, churches would be built up that would teach with their learning and deny the Holy Ghost which giveth utterance. He also pronounced woe upon him that hearkeneth unto the precepts of men and denieth the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us that when the Savior gave His final instructions to His disciples, He promised that He would send them the Comforter. Earlier, He had taught them the mission of this Comforter, which is otherwise referred to as the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, or simply the Spirit. That Comforter dwells in us. He teaches us all things and brings all things to our remembrance. He guides us into truth and shows us things to come. He testifies of the Son. The Bible also teaches that the Savior and His servants will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. I will speak of the meaning of that teaching later. The Bible's teachings about the Holy Ghost are reaffirmed and elaborated in the Book of Mormon and in modern revelations. The Holy Ghost is the means by which God inspires and reveals His will to His children. The Holy Ghost bears record of the Father and of the Son. He enlightens our minds and fills us with joy. By the power of the Holy Ghost, we may know the truth of all things. By His power, we may have the mysteries of God unfolded to us, all things which are expedient. The Holy Ghost shows us what we should do. We teach the gospel as we are directed by the Holy Ghost, which carries our words into the hearts of those we teach. Latter-day scriptures also teach that the remission of sins, which is made possible by the Atonement, comes by baptism and by fire, yea, even the Holy Ghost. Thus the risen Lord pleaded with the Nephites to repent and come unto Him and be baptized, that ye may be sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost, that ye may stand spotless before Me at the last day. The gift of the Holy Ghost is so important to our faith that a prophet gave it unique emphasis in a conversation with the President of the United States. Joseph Smith had journeyed to Washington to seek help in recovering compensation for injuries and losses the Saints had suffered in the Missouri persecutions. In his meeting with the President, Joseph was asked how this Church differed from the other religions of the day. The prophet replied that we differed in mode of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. He later explained that this answer was given because all other considerations were contained in the gift of the Holy Ghost. In highlighting the gift of the Holy Ghost as a distinguishing characteristic of our faith, we need to understand the important differences between the light of Christ, a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, and the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
The light of Christ, which is sometimes called the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of God, giveth light to every man that cometh into the world. This is the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things. The prophet Mormon taught that the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. President Lorenzo Snow spoke of this light when he said, Everybody has the Spirit of God. The light of Christ enlightens and gives understanding to all men. In contrast, a manifestation of the Holy Ghost is more focused. This manifestation is given to acquaint sincere seekers with the truth about the Lord and His gospel. For example, the prophet Moroni promises that when we study the Book of Mormon and seek to know whether it is true, sincerely and with real intent, God will manifest the truth of it unto us by the power of the Holy Ghost. Moroni also records this promise from the risen Lord. He that believeth these things which I have spoken, him will I visit with the manifestations of my spirit, and he shall know and bear record. For because of my spirit he shall know that these things are true. These manifestations are available to everyone. The Book of Mormon declares that the Savior manifesteth himself unto all those who believe in him by the power of the Holy Ghost, yea, unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. To repeat, the light of Christ is given to all men and women that they may know good from evil. Manifestations of the Holy Ghost are given to lead sincere seekers to gospel truths that will persuade them to repentance and baptism. The gift of the Holy Ghost is more comprehensive. The Prophet Joseph Smith explained, There is a difference between the Holy Ghost and the gift of the Holy Ghost. Cornelius received the Holy Ghost before he was baptized, which was the convincing power of God unto him of the truth of the gospel. But he could not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost until after he was baptized. Had he not taken this sign or ordinance upon him, the Holy Ghost, which convinced him of the truth of God, would have left him. The gift of the Holy Ghost includes the right to constant companionship, that we may always have His Spirit to be with us. A newly baptized member told me what she felt when she received that gift. This was a faithful Christian woman who had spent her life in service to others. She knew and loved the Lord, and she had felt the manifestations of His Spirit. When she received the added light of the restored gospel, she was baptized, and the elders placed their hands upon her head and gave her the gift of the Holy Ghost. She recalled, quote, I felt the influence of the Holy Ghost settle upon me with greater intensity than I had ever felt before. He was like an old friend who had guided me in the past, but now had come to stay. End of quote. For faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ, the companionship of the Holy Spirit should be so familiar that we must use care not to take it for granted. For example, that good feeling you have felt during the messages and music of this conference is a confirming witness of the Spirit, available to faithful members on a continuing basis. A member once asked me why he felt so good about the talks and music in a sacrament meeting while a guest he had invited that day apparently experienced no such feeling. This is but one illustration of the contrast between one who has the gift of the Holy Ghost and is in tune with his promptings and one who has not or is not. If we are practicing our faith and seeking the companionship of the Holy Spirit, His presence can be felt in our hearts and in our homes. A family having daily family prayers and seeking to keep the commandments of God and honor His name and speak lovingly to one another will have a spiritual feeling in their home that will be discernible to all who enter it. I know this because I have felt the presence or absence of that feeling 
in many LDS homes. It is important to remember that the illumination and revelation that come to an individual as a result of the gift of the Holy Ghost do not come suddenly or without seeking. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that the Holy Ghost comes a little at a time as you merit it, and as your life is in harmony, you gradually receive the Holy Ghost in a great measure. The blessings available through the gift of the Holy Ghost are conditioned upon worthiness. The Spirit of the Lord doth not dwell in unholy temples. Even though we have a right to His constant companionship, the Spirit of the Lord will only dwell with us when we keep the commandments. He will withdraw when we offend Him by profanity, uncleanliness, disobedience, rebellion, or other serious sins. Worthy men and women who have the gift of the Holy Ghost can be edified and guided by inspiration and revelation. The Lord has declared that the mysteries of His kingdom are only to be seen and understood by the power of the Holy Spirit, which God bestows on those who love Him and purify themselves before Him. A few years ago, I met with a prospective mission president and his wife to discuss their availability for service. I asked whether their responsibilities to aged parents would preclude their service at that time. This sister was the only daughter of a wonderful mother, then about 80, whom she visited and helped each week. Though somewhat dependent physically, this mother was strong spiritually. She had served four missions and 15 years as a temple worker. Because she was in tune with the Spirit, she had a remarkable experience. Several months before this interview, she told her daughter that the Spirit had whispered to her that her daughter's husband would be called as a mission president. So advised, the mother had prepared herself for the needed separation and assured her daughter long in advance of my assignment for the exploratory interview that she would not be a hindrance to their service. The need to keep our personal temple clean in order to have the companionship and guidance of the Holy Ghost explains the importance of the commandment to partake of the sacrament on the Sabbath. In partaking of the sacrament, we can renew the effects of our baptism. When we desire a remission of our sins through the Atonement of our Savior, we are commanded to repent and come to Him with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. In the waters of baptism, we witness to the Lord that we have repented of our sins and are willing to take His name upon us and serve Him to the end. The effects are described by Nephi. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh a remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. That last promise is fulfilled as a result of our receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. The renewal of our covenants by partaking of the sacrament should also be preceded by repentance, so that we come to that sacred ordinance with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Then, as we renew our baptismal covenants and affirm that we will always remember Him, the Lord will renew the promised remission of our sins under the conditions and at the time He chooses. One of the primary purposes and effects of the renewal of covenants and cleansing from sin is that we may always have His Spirit to be with us. My brothers and sisters, I solemnly witness to you that these doctrines and principles are true. In view of these truths, I plead with all members of the Church, young and old, to attend sacrament meeting each Sabbath day and to partake of the sacrament with the repentant attitude described as a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I pray that we will do so with the reverence and worship of our Savior that will signify a serious covenant to always remember Him. The Savior Himself has said that we should partake 
with an eye single to my glory, remembering unto the Father my body, which was laid down for you, and my blood, which was shed for the remission of your sins. I pray that we will also partake of the sacrament with the submissive manner that will help us accept and serve in Church callings in order to comply with our solemn covenant to take His name and His work upon us. I also plead for us to comply with our solemn covenant to keep His commandments. To those brothers and sisters who have allowed themselves to become lax in this vital renewal of the covenants of the sacrament, I plead in words of the First Presidency that you come back and feast at the table of the Lord and taste again the sweet and satisfying fruits of fellowship with the saints. Let us qualify ourselves for our Savior's promise that by partaking of the sacrament we will be filled, which means that we will be filled with the Spirit. That Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is our comforter, our direction finder, our communicator, our interpreter, our witness, and our purifier, our infallible guide and sanctifier for our mortal journey toward eternal life. Any who may have thought it a small thing to partake of the sacrament should remember the Lord's declaration that the foundation of a great work is laid by small things, for out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Out of the seemingly small act of consciously and reverently renewing our baptismal covenants comes a renewal of the blessings of baptism by water and by the Spirit, that we may always have His Spirit to be with us. In this way, all of us will be guided, and in this way, all of us can be cleansed. That we may qualify for these precious blessings is my humble prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Hillard Allen H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles has spoken to us. The choir then sang, Consider the Lilies. The choir and congregation will now join in singing High on the Mountain Top. We shall then hear from Bishop Richard C. Edgeley, first counselor in the presiding bishopric. Today I would like to address my remarks to those who are not of our faith, who are joining us in these proceedings. I speak as one of approximately 100,000 mothers and fathers of more than 50,000 missionaries from our Church who are serving the Lord in all parts of the world. Paraphrasing the slogan of a prominent greeting card, we care enough to send our very best. The parents I speak for today come from all parts of the world. They come from the plains of Iowa and the streets of the Bronx. They come from the cities of Peru and Bolivia. They come from the rolling mountains of the Ozarks and the jungles of Colombia and Kenya. They come from every economic, social background there is. Yet they all have one common trait. They cared enough to send their very best. Yes, we send to you for two years our choice young men and women at the dawn of their adulthood. We send to you our children whom we have loved, taught, and nurtured. We rejoice in their successes, we suffer their discouragements and setbacks, and we pray for them continually. In short, we have the same loving feelings, emotions, and dreams for them as you have for your children. We send these young men, young women, and mature couples to all parts of the world wherever hosting governments and countries will welcome them. They live under all sorts of conditions, almost always substantially below the comforts to which they are accustomed. They often live in unfamiliar environments which are sometimes unfriendly to those who would teach the saving truths of Jesus Christ. To the many thousands of you not of our faith who have befriended these young people, we give our most sincere thanks, and we pray that God's choicest blessings will be with you. The call to serve a mission seldom comes at a convenient time. Most are just a year out of high school. Many have just begun their university studies. 
Some have delayed or even foregone promising professions. Cars are sold, sweethearts are put on hold, college is delayed, scholarships are forfeited, careers are postponed. Behind each missionary is a private story of years of personal commitment, preparation, personal sacrifice, and examples of love for the Savior. And there are those worthy young men and young women who have in their hearts the greatest desire to serve a mission, but because of physical, health, or other limiting circumstances are honorably excused. A missionary's life is not an easy one. After preparing through childhood and teen years by studying the scriptures, preparing financially, and maintaining personal worthiness, including sexual purity and abstinence from tobacco, alcohol, and drugs, missionaries enter one of several missionary training centers scattered throughout the world. This is the only formal training they will receive. Two weeks, if they are called to serve in, a, in the country of their native language, or two months if they must learn a foreign language. Their day in the mission field is demanding. It begins every morning at 6.30 a.m. with one hour of study, a dozen of hours of hard and often discouraging work, continuing till bedtime around 10 p.m. Their work consists mostly of proselyting and teaching, but also includes a generous amount of time for voluntary community service. They can be seen teaching English in foreign lands, donating time in hospitals and retirement homes, serving meals at homeless shelters, or doing other service for the benefit of the community. They have part of one day a week for personal preparedness, letter writing, and some relaxation and recreation. Excluded from their mission are dating, secular music, beaches, swimming, and many other activities considered normal for young men and women of this age. Some outside our Church may feel that a mission is a great and unreasonable sacrifice. Our missionaries do not view it as a sacrifice. They view it as an opportunity to manifest their love to the Savior who charged, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They see it as an opportunity to express their love to all mankind. They see it as an opportunity to testify of Jesus Christ the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of the world. They see it as an opportunity to build faith in Christ and to teach His saving and comforting doctrine. I see it as truly one of the distinguishing characteristics of true Christianity. I see these young missionaries as true Christian servants, exemplifying the highest Christian principles by testifying of and serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They just keep coming. Today, more than 50,000. Tomorrow, more than 60. And then 70,000 young men, young women, and couples serving all the, over the world. At a time when so many young men and women of this age are searching, Wandering aimlessly and struggling with the meaning and purpose of life, tens of thousands are fully devoted to this great cause of serving the Lord. They prepare, they sacrifice, and they come. They come because they believe in God and they believe in the brotherhood of all mankind. Some have questioned why our missionaries would be sent to all parts of the world even among our fellow Christians. In the third chapter of John, verse 16, we read the familiar scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our missionaries go to all nations and all people because they have a firm, unshakable testimony 
that God still loves the world and that he has spoken again as an indication of that love. He has restored precious truths lost over the centuries of Christian persecution, dark ages, and years of confusion, truths that are essential to our peace and our happiness. These are truths so essential to our eternal salvation that our loving Father restored them in their completeness. After Christ's ministry and ascension to heaven, the Apostle Peter prophesied of a restitution of all things before Christ would return for his second coming. He said, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. These missionaries go into all the world full of love and faith because they know of the fulfillment of Peter's prophecy of a restitution of all things. They testify of a restoration that is so marvelous that only the hand of God could be its author, so miraculous that it can only be believed if one understands the power of God and his love for all mankind. A story so divine that the truth of it can only be truly accepted through the personal manifestation of the Holy Ghost, which the Savior promised as his way of testifying to truth to those who prayerfully seek it. Our missionaries do not attempt to take away any precious truths, values, or principles that have led so many of you to a life of righteous service and devotion to the Savior. Rather, they come to your homes to present further evidence, additional scripture that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ who indeed hung upon the cross and atoned for our sins. They bring a message of confirmation of his life and magnification of his goodness and love. They will testify to you of a marvelous vision, considered miraculous in today's world of doubt, yet would easily be accepted if it had occurred 2,000 years ago. These missionaries will explain how God and Christ appeared to a young boy only 14 years of age to commence this restoration. They will tell you about other heavenly messengers who have come to restore Christ's authority, doctrine, and teachings in their completeness and simplicity. They will tell you of events and truths so beautiful and wonderful, so marvelous that you will thrill as they unfold before you. The missionaries will explain to you the very purpose of this life that we call mortality. They will help you understand where we came from why we are here, and why it is necessary and even desirable to experience the vicissitudes of mortality, including suffering, pain, sin, and death, as well as joy and happiness. They will explain how through Christ's teachings one finds peace and direction in a sometimes troubled and turbulent world. Perhaps most important of all, they will explain God's view of the importance and sanctity of the family. To husbands and wives who love each other and who love their children, there will be a message of how you can have your families forever, eternally, beyond the grave. And finally, they will explain how you can gain your personal witness as to the truthfulness of these things. And so we do care enough to send our very best. To all of you who are not of our faith, when two young men dressed in white shirts and ties, two lovely young women, or a noble couple knock at your door and introduce themselves as representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, may I invite you to let them in. Listen to their message and evaluate for yourself. May I suggest that you not just accept their message, but that you inquire fervently of our Father in Heaven as to its truthfulness and its value to you and your family. For He is the author of all truth, 
and has promised his witness to those who earnestly seek it. I testify to you that the Spirit has borne witness to me that these things are true. The Spirit has borne witness to over 50,000 missionaries and 100,000 parents and thousands of family members who are sacrificing and giving their most precious gift of all to bring this message to you. We jointly testify that the Spirit will bear witness to you if you will receive the message and ask Heavenly Father for a personal confirmation of its truthfulness. I add my solemn testimony to that of our missionaries, their parents, and millions of others who have received this same witness that God lives, that Jesus is the Christ, He is our Savior, our Redeemer, and He loves us, and He has restored His gospel in its fullness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Bishop Richard C. Edgeley, First Counselor in the Presiding Bishopric, has just spoken to us, and we will now be pleased to hear Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. I, too, wish to speak to all those who would like to know about eternal families and about families being forever. One year ago, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints issued a proclamation to the world concerning the family. It summarizes eternal gospel principles that have been taught since the beginning of recorded history, even before the earth was created. The doctrine of the family begins with heavenly parents. Our highest aspiration is to be like them. The Apostle Paul taught that God is the Father of our spirits. From the proclamation, we read, In the premortal realm, spirits, sons, and daughters knew and worshiped God and their eternal Father and accepted His plan by which His children could obtain a physical body and gain eternal earthly experience to progress toward perfection and ultimately realize his or her divine destiny as heir of eternal life. The proclamation also reiterates to the world that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and the family is central to the Creator's plan of the eternal destiny of his children. From the earliest beginnings, God established the family and made it eternal. Adam and Eve were sealed in marriage for time and all eternity, and thus all things were confirmed unto Adam by an holy ordinance and gospel preached and a decree sent forth that it should be in the world until the end thereof, and thus it was. And Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and replenish the earth. The Savior himself spoke of this sacred marriage covenant and promise when he gave the authority to his disciples to bind in heaven sacred covenants made on earth. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In this latter day, the promise of eternal families was restored in 1829 when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood were restored to the earth. Seven years later, in the Kirkland Temple, the keys to perform the sealing ordinances were restored as recorded in the Doctrine and Covenants. Elijah the prophet, who who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi. The keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands. With the restoration of these keys and priesthood authority comes the opportunity for all who are worthy to receive the blessings of eternal families. Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out. 
and the endowment which my servants have endowed in this house? What is the promise of these sealings which are performed in the temple? The Lord outlines the promise and requirements in these sacred verses. And again, verily, I say unto you, if a man marry a woman by my word, which is my law, and by the new and everlasting covenant, and it is, un and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, unto whom I have appointed this power and the keys of this priesthood, and it shall be said of them, he shall come forth in the first resurrection, and if it be after the first resurrection, in the next resurrection, and shall inherit the thrones, kingdoms, principalities, powers, dominions, and all heights and depths, then shall it be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and shall be of full force when they are out of this world, and they shall pass by the angels and gods which are set there, to their exaltation and glory in all things, as hath been sealed upon their heads, which glory shall be a fullness and a continuation of the seeds for ever and ever. As taught in this scripture, an eternal bond doesn't just happen as a result of sealing covenants we make in the temple. How we conduct ourselves in this life will determine that who we will be and what we will be in all the eternities to come. To receive the blessings of the sealing that our Heavenly Father has given to us, we have to keep commandments and conduct ourselves in such a way that our families will want to live with us in the eternities. The family relationships we have here on this earth are important, but they are much more important for their effect on our families for generations in mortality and throughout all eternity. By divine commandment, spouses are required to love each other above all others. The Lord clearly declares, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto her and none else. The proclamation states, By divine design, fathers are to preside over their families in love and righteousness, and are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. By divine design, mothers are primarily responsible for the nurturing of their children. By divine design, husband and wife are equal partners in their marriage and parental responsibilities. By direct commandment of God, parents have a sacred duty to teach their children to love and serve one another, to observe the commandments of God, and to be law-abiding citizens in the countries where they reside. Because of the importance of the family to the eternal plan of happiness, Satan makes a major effort to destroy the sanctity of the family, demean the importance of the role of men and women, encourage moral uncleanliness and violations of sacred law of chastity, and to discourage parents from placing the bearing and rearing of children as one of their highest priorities. So fundamental is the family unit to the plan of salvation that God has declared a warning that those individuals who violate the covenants of chastity, who abuse spouse or offspring, or who fail to fulfill family responsibilities will one day stand accountable before God their Maker. The disintegration of the family will bring upon individuals, communities, and nations the calamities foretold by ancient and modern prophets. While our individual salvation is based on our individual obedience, it is equally important that we understand that we are each an important and integral part of a family, and the highest blessings can be received only within an eternal family. When families are functioning as designed by God, the relationships found therein are the most valued of mortality. The plan of the Father is that the family love and companionship will continue into the eternities. Being one in a family carries a great responsibility of caring, loving, lifting, and strengthening each member of the family so that all can righteously endure to the end and in mortality and dwell together throughout eternity. It is not enough just to save ourselves. It is equally important that parents, brothers, and sisters are saved in our families. If we return home alone to our Heavenly Father, we will be asked, where is the rest of the family? This is why we teach that families are forever. 
the eternal nature of an individual becomes the eternal nature of the family. The eternal nature of our body and our spirit is a question often pondered by those who live in mortality. All people who will ever live on earth are members of a human family and are eternal children of God, our loving Heavenly Father. After birth and tasting of death and mortality, all will be resurrected because of the Atonement of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God the Father. Depending on our individual obedience to the laws, ordinances, and commandments of God, each mortal can have the blessing of attaining eternal life, that is, returning to live in the presence of their Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, for all the eternities to come. Through making and keeping the sacred covenants found in the temple ordinances, individuals can return to the presence of God and be reunited with their families eternally. The home is where we are nurtured and where we prepare ourselves for living in mortality. It is also where we prepare ourselves for death and for immortality because of our belief and understanding that there is life after death, not only for the individual but also for the family. Some of the greatest lessons of gospel principles about the eternal nature of the family are learned as we observe how members of the Church, when faced with adversity, apply gospel principles in their lives and in their homes. In the past year, I have witnessed the blessings of joy which come to those who honor and revere the gospel teaching of the eternal family during times of adversity in their lives. A few months ago, I had the opportunity of visiting a man who had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. As a devoted priesthood holder, he was confronted with the realities of mortality. He found strength, however, in the example of the Savior, who in the Lord's Prayer, after this manner, therefore pray ye, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. My friend took courage in knowing that as Jesus was required to endure great pain and agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, while completing the atoning sacrifice, he uttered the words, O oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. My friend came to accept the phrase, thy will be done, as he faced his own poignant trials and tribulations. As a faithful member of the Church, he was now confronted with some sobering concerns. Particularly touching were his questions. Have I done all that I need to do to faithfully endure to the end? What will death be like? Will my family be prepared to stand in faith and be self-reliant when I am gone? We had the opportunity to discuss all three questions. They are clearly answered in the doctrine and taught to us by our Savior. We discussed how he had spent his life striving to be faithful, to do what God asked of him, to be honest in his dealings with his fellow men, and to with all others, to care for and love his family. Isn't that is meant what is meant by enduring to the end? We talked about what happens immediately after death, about what God has taught us about the world of spirits. It is a place of paradise and happiness for those who have lived righteous lives. It is not something to fear. After our conversation, he called together his wife and extended family, children and grandchildren, to teach them the doctrine of the Atonement, that all would be resurrected. Everyone came to understand that, just as the Lord has said, while there will be mourning at the temporary separation, there is no sorrow for those who die in the Lord. His blessing promised him comfort and reassurance that all would be well, that he would not have pain, that he would have additional time to prepare his family for his departure, even that he would know the time of his departure. The family related to me that on the night before he passed away, he said he would go on the morrow. He passed away the next afternoon at peace with all his family at his side. This is the solace and comfort that comes to us when we understand the gospel plan and know that families are forever. Contrast these events with an incident which happened to me when I was a young man in my early twenties. 
While serving in the Air Force, one of the pilots in my squadron crashed on a training mission and was killed. I was assigned to accompany my fallen comrade on his final journey home to be buried in Brooklyn. I had the honor of standing by his family during the viewing and funeral services and representing our government and presenting the flag to his grieving widow at the graveside. The funeral service was dark and dismal. No mention was made of his goodness or his accomplishments. His name was never mentioned. At the conclusion of the services, his widow turned to me and asked, Bob, what is really going to happen to Don? I was then able to give her the sweet doctrine of the resurrection and the reality that if baptized and sealed in the temple for time and all eternity, they could be together eternally. The clergyman standing next to her said, that is the most beautiful doctrine I have ever heard. The fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ brings great comfort in stressful times of mortality. It brings light where there is darkness and a calming influence where there is turmoil. It gives eternal hope where there is mortal despair. It is more than just beautiful doctrine. It's a reality in our lives that if we can be obedient and obtain the eternal rewards that God grants us, if we will draw nigh unto Him and embrace the eternal doctrine, we will be blessed. Another incident that has touched my life recently happened when a young man with a terminal illness passed away. He knew that his illness would first take away his manual dexterity and his ability to walk. Then its progression would take his ability to speak. And finally, his respiratory system would cease to function. But he also had faith that families are forever. With this knowledge, he spoke to each of his children and recorded video recordings for when he was gone. He produced recordings to be given to his sons and daughters at important sacred occasions in their lives, such as baptisms, priesthood ordinations, and weddings. He spoke to them with tender love of a father who knew that while his family was forever, for a time he would not physically be able to be with them, but spiritually he would never leave their side. The knowledge and understanding of the doctrine that God lives and Jesus is the Christ, and that we have an opportunity to be resurrected and live in the presence of God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ, makes it possible to endure otherwise tragic events. The doctrine brings a brightness of hope again into another otherwise dark and dreary world. It answers the simple questions of where we came from, why we are here, and where we are going. These are the truths that must be taught and practiced in our home. I want to express appreciation to every widow with her faith that gives us faith and their children when they lose their husband and father, for every widower who loses a wife, and for the children who remain faithful and teach us by their faith this doctrine. God lives. Jesus is the Christ. Through His resurrection, we will all have the opportunity of being resurrected. This is not just an individual blessing. It is much more than that. It is a blessing to each one of us and to our families that we may be eternally grateful that we can live in the presence of God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, that we may be together in the eternities to come, that we might understand the joy. And it is not only that we teach the doctrine, but we live true to it in our lives and in our families. It is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve has just spoken to us, and the choir has sung, I Need Thee Every Hour. Following my remarks, the choir will sing, Lead Kindly Light, and the benediction will be offered by Elder Dennis E. Simmons of the Seventy. The concluding session of this conference will begin at 2 o'clock this afternoon. <clears throat> Half, possibly more than half, of the adult members of the Church are women. It is to them that I wish particularly to speak this morning. I do so with the hope that the men will also hear. <laughs> First, let me say to you, sisters, that you do not hold a second place in our Father's plan for the eternal happiness and well-being of His children. You are an absolutely essential part of that plan. Without you, the plan could not function. Without you, the entire program would be frustrated. As I have said before from this pulpit, when the process of creation occurred, Jehovah the Creator, under instruction from His Father, first divided the light from the darkness and then separated the land from the waters. There followed the creation of plant life followed by the creation of animal life. Then came the creation of man, and culminating that act of divinity came the crowning act, the creation of woman. Each of you is a daughter of God endowed with a divine birthright. You need no defense of that position. As I go about from place to place, I am interviewed by representatives of the media. Invariably, they ask about the place of women in the Church. They do so in an almost accusatory tone, as if we denigrate and demean women. I invariably reply that I know of no other organization in all the world which affords women so many opportunities for development, for sociality, for the accomplishment of great good, for holding positions of leadership and responsibility. I wish all of these reporters could have been in the tabernacle a week ago Saturday when the General Relief Society meeting was held. It was an inspiration to look into the faces of that vast gathering of daughters of God, women of faith and ability, women who know what life is about and have something of a sense of the divinity of their creation. I wish they could have heard that great chorus of young women from Brigham Young University who touched our hearts with the beauty of their singing. I wish they could have heard the stirring messages of the Relief Society General Presidency, each of whom spoke on a phase of the subject, faith, hope, and charity. What able people these women are! They express themselves with power and conviction and great persuasiveness. President Faust concluded that service with a wonderful talk. If these reporters who are prone to raise this question could have sat in that vast congregation, they would have known even without further inquiry that there is strength and great capacity in the women of this Church. There is leadership and direction, a certain spirit of independence and yet great satisfaction in being a part of this the Lord's kingdom and of working hand in hand with the priesthood to move it forward. Many of you are here today who are in that meeting. Today you are seated with your husbands men whom you love and honor and respect, and who in turn love and honor and respect you. You know how fortunate you are to be married to a good man who is your companion in life and who will be your companion throughout eternity. Together as you have served in many capacities and reared your families and provided for them, you have faced a variety of storms and come through them all with your heads held high. Most of you are mothers and very many of you are grandmothers and even great-grandmothers. You have walked the sometimes painful, sometimes joyous path 
of parenthood. You have walked hand in hand with God in the great process of bringing children into the world that they might experience this estate along the road of immortality and eternal life. It has not been easy rearing a family. Most of you have had to sacrifice and skimp and labor night and day. As I think of you and your circumstances, I think of the words of Ann Campbell, who wrote as she looked upon her children, You are the trip I did not take. You are the pearls I cannot buy. You are my blue Italian lake. You are my piece of foreign sky. You sisters are the real builders of the nation <laughs> wherever you live. For you have created homes of strength and peace and security. These become the very sinew of any nation. Unfortunately, a few of you may be married to men who are abusive. Some of them put on a fine face before the world during the day and come home in the evening, set aside their self-discipline, and on the slightest provocation fly into outbursts of anger. No man who engages in such evil and unbecoming behavior is worthy of the priesthood of God. No man who so conducts himself is worthy of the privileges of the house of the Lord. I regret that there are some men undeserving of the love of their wives and children. There are children who fear their fathers and wives who fear their husbands. If there be any such within the hearing of my voice, as a servant of the Lord, I rebuke you and call you to repentance. Discipline yourselves. Master your temper. Most of the things that make you angry are of very small consequence. And what a terrible price you're paying for your anger. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask your wife to forgive you. Apologize to your children. There are many women among us who are single. Generally, this is not of their own choice. Some have never had the opportunity to marry one with whom they'd wish to spend eternity. To you single women who wish to be married, I repeat what I recently said in a meeting for singles in this tabernacle. Do not give up hope and do not give up trying, but do give up being obsessed with it. The chances are that if you forget about it and become anxiously engaged in other activities, the prospects will brighten immeasurably. I believe that for most of us, the best medicine for loneliness is work, service in behalf of others. I do not minimize your problems, but I no, do not hesitate to say that there are many others whose problems are more serious than are yours. Reach out to serve them, to help them, to encourage them. There are so many boys and girls who fail in school for want of a little personal attention and encouragement. There are so many elderly people who live in misery and loneliness and fear for whom a simple conversation would bring a measure of hope and happiness. Included among the women of the Church are those who have lost their husbands through abandonment, divorce, and death. Great is our obligation to you. As the scriptures declare, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. I received a letter from one who counts herself fortunate, and indeed fortunate she is. She writes, Although I have been raising our four boys as a single parent, I am not alone. I have a wonderful ward family that has rallied around us. My Relief Society presence has been there for me through my greatest hardships, encouraging my spiritual growth, personal prayer, and temple attendance. Our bishop has been generous in providing needed food and clothing, 
and has helped send two of the boys to camp. He's had interviews with all of us and given each of us blessings and needed encouragement. He's helped me to budget and do what I can to help my family. Our home teachers have come regularly and even gave the boys blessings as they started the new school year. Our state president and his counselors have checked in on us on a regular basis by taking time to visit with us at church, on the phone, or visiting our home. This church is true, and my boys and I are living proof that God loves us and that a ward family can make all the difference. Our priesthood leaders have been instrumental in keeping the boys active in church and in the scouting program. One is an Eagle Scout and is receiving his fourth palm this week. Another is an Eagle with three palms. And a third has just turned in his Eagle papers this week. The youngest is a Weebelows and loves Cub Scouts. We are always met with loving hearts and warm handshakes. The Christ-like attitude of the stake in our ward has helped us through trials we never imagined possible. Life has been hard, but we put on the whole armor of God as we kneel in family prayer, asking for help and guidance and sharing thanks for the blessings we received. I pray daily for the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost to guide me as I raise these boys to be missionaries and encourage them to be true to the gospel and the priesthood they hold. I am proud to say I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I know this church is true. I sustain my church leaders. We're doing well, and I thank everyone for their love and prayers and acceptance. What a great letter that is. How much it says about the way this church functions and should function throughout the world. I hope that every woman who finds herself in the kind of circumstances in which this woman lives is similarly blessed with an understanding and helpful bishop, with a Relief Society president who knows how to assist her, with home teachers who know where their duty lies and how to fulfill it, and with a host of ward members who are helpful without being intrusive. I've never met the woman whose letter I've read. Notwithstanding the cheerful attitude she conveys, I am sure there's been much of struggle and loneliness and, at times, fear. I notice that she works to provide for her needs and the needs of her boys who are in their teens. I assume her income is inadequate because she indicates that the bishop has helped them with food and clothing. Some years ago, President Benson delivered a message to the women of the Church. He encouraged them to leave their employment and give their individual time to their children. I sustain the position which he took. Nevertheless, I recognize, as he recognized, that there are some women — it has become very many, in fact — who have to work to provide for the needs of their families. To you, I say, do the very best you can. I hope that if you are employed full-time, you are doing it to ensure that basic needs are met and not simply to indulge a taste for an elaborate home, fancy cars, and other luxuries. The greatest job that any mother will ever do will be in nurturing, teaching, lifting, encouraging, and rearing her children in righteousness and truth. None other can adequately take her place. It is well nigh impossible to be a full-time homemaker and a full-time employee. I know how some of you struggle with decisions concerning this matter. I repeat, do the very best you can. You know your circumstances, and I know that you are deeply concerned for the welfare of your children. Each of you has a bishop who will counsel with you and assist you. If you feel you need to speak with an understanding woman, do not hesitate to get in touch with your Relief Society president. 
to the mothers of this church, every mother who is here today, I want to say that as the years pass, you will become increasingly grateful for that which you did in molding the lives of your children in the direction of righteousness and goodness, integrity and faith. That is most likely to happen if you can spend adequate time with them. For you who are single parents, I say that many hands stand ready to help you. The Lord is not unmindful of you, neither is his church. May he bless you, my beloved sisters, who find yourselves in the situation of single parenthood. May you have health, strength, vitality to carry the heavy burden that is yours. May you have loving friends and associates to bear you up in your times of trial. You know the power of prayers, perhaps few others do. Many of you spend much time on your knees speaking with your Father in heaven with tears running down your cheeks. Please know that we also pray for you. With all that you have to do, you are also asked to serve in the Church. Your bishop will not ask you to do anything that is beyond your capacity. And as you so serve, a new dimension will be added to your life. You will find new associations, stimulating associations. You will find friendship and sociality. You will grow in knowledge and understanding and wisdom and in your capacity to do. You will become a better mother because of the service you give in the work of the Lord. Now, in conclusion, I wish to say a word to you older women, many of whom are widows. You are a great treasure. You have passed through the storms of life. You have weathered the challenges now facing your younger sisters. You are mature in wisdom, in understanding, in compassion, in love and service. There is a certain beauty that shines through your countenance. It is the beauty that comes of peace. There may still be struggle, but there is mature wisdom to meet it. There are health problems, but there is a certain composure concerning them. The bad memories of the past have largely been forgotten, while the good memories return and bring sweet and satisfying enrichment to life. You have learned to love the scriptures, and you read them. Your prayers, for the most part, are prayers of thanksgiving. Your greetings are words of kindness. Your friendship is a sturdy staff on which others may lean. What a resource you are to the women of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You love this Church. You accept its doctrine. You honor your place in its organization. You bring luster and strength and beauty to its congregations. How thankful we are to you how much you are loved, respected, and honored. I salute my own beloved companion. It will soon be 60 years that we walked from the Salt Lake Temple as husband and wife with love for one another. That love has strengthened through these years. We have faced many problems during our years of marriage. <clears throat> Somehow, with the blessing of the Lord, we have survived them all. It is becoming physically harder to stand tall and straight as we did in our younger years. No matter, we still have one another, and we still stand together, even though we lean a little. <laughs> and when the time for separation comes, there will be much of sorrow, but there will also be the comfort that will come from the assurance that she is mine and I am hers for the eternity that lies ahead. And so, my beloved sisters, please know how much we appreciate you. You bring a measure of wholeness to us. You have great strength. With dignity and tremendous ability, you carry forward the remarkable programs of the Relief Society, the young women in the primary. You teach Sunday school. We walk at your side as your companions and your brethren with respect and love, with honor and great admiration. 
It was the Lord who designated that men in his church should hold the priesthood. It was he who has given you your capabilities to round out this great and marvelous organization, which is the Church and Kingdom of God. I bear testimony before the entire world of your worth, of your grace and goodness, of your remarkable abilities and tremendous contributions, and invoke the blessings of heaven upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our loving Father, we bow our heads and express our deep gratitude that the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored in our day. We, thankful, we are thankful that we have apostles and prophets to teach us and to give us thy word. We express thanks for thy prophet our leader, and commit ourselves to honor thy word as we receive it from him and his associates. We are grateful, Father, to know of our relationship with thee, that we are thy children, and that our brothers and sisters fill the entire world. We are mindful of the ravages of war, of hunger, of pestilence, of famine, and we ask Thee to bless us as these and other challenges humble hearts and soften spirits. We will be able to assist in doing Thy work. Bless us that we might join with our full-time missionaries in teaching truth. Bless us that we might do Thy work in lifting hearts in helping those who have difficulty and challenge to understand who they are, that we with they may seek thy reward of peace 
and understanding. We commit ourselves to honor the great heritage that we have by virtue of our spirit birth and do so with gratitude in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.